Hi, and welcome to Luminaria, the podcast where we explore New Mexico history and genealogy. I'm Kat, and I'm riding solo today. I'm going to talk about my Pacheco line, which is the first line that I found when I first started exploring many years ago, and really uh, just a, a fascinating line that just had ups and downs and just the discovery process again and again as I first got started, really just drew me in and uh, got me hooked, for sure. So it's kind of hard to know where to start. Um, I will just give a little disclaimer from the beginning that I probably shouldn't be doing this podcast. I There's many, many other people, I mean, so many other people who are better qualified to do this podcast, but I'm going to go ahead and, and just go for it anyways. Because I don't go back or I haven't got really gone back more than uh, probably like the mid 1800s of my research. Um, I have a little bit here and there, of course, and and of course, um, we'll get into it in, in f- future episodes, looking at DNA and some of our progenitors, of course, uh, is is a little more accessible for New Mexicans because uh, we descended from from very few families when it comes down to it. But when it comes to actual research, my paper trail, the the work that I do has really focused on really just one or two generations back. Uh, My excuse for this is that maybe I'm a perfectionist or a completist. And so because of course I haven't found everything there is to find about the ancestors I've uncovered so far, but going back to great grandparents, great, great grandparents, I just want to keep going until I feel like I've finished them, which is ridiculous. Um, save your comments. Uh, also I, because it's a little more recent, there's so much material out there to flesh out their lives. So it's not just names and, dates and places, but newspaper articles, um, just, just, they feel very close to me. And I know them very well through all this research. And so, and then also I, I haven't resolved my Romero line past my, uh, like 1894. I can't go past 1894, which is so recent. So I feel like until I can clear that brick wall, I don't want to spend time or resources or energy on going back further. So just a little disclaimer that I really don't have a ton of information about uh, my ancestry going, going, you know, details going back uh, super far so far. I, I see everybody on the groups and everybody else at this point is clearly way back in the 1600s or 1500s or even earlier. I'm just not there yet. Hopefully I will be one day. So uh, I'll just go ahead and start uh, with my great-grandfather, Juan Andres Pacheco. He, I guess I should should start by saying that, you know, as I said, mentioned in the first episode, my, my dad really didn't know very much about his family or family history at all. And his mother uh, was a Pacheco, obviously, and I think it was her notes and or her family's notes that uh, took me to those initial finds that I found on Ancestry during my uh, the scam uh, two week free trial that's that just sucks us all in and spits us out years later. Um, my grandmother, well, my father grew up. I I knew his upbringing as of of a upbringing of, of extreme poverty. He uh, grew up, uh, well, first of all, in an abandoned railroad car. My grandfather worked for the railroad, and they lived in an, the workers were allowed to live in the train cars that were abandoned. So that's where my father and his siblings uh, grew up for their formative years. It was up in the mountains in Victor, Colorado. And, you know, hearing stories about 
how hard that was and how much that shaped his life. And then learning more about my grandmother. She grew up in extreme poverty as well. She had the just the hardest life. Um, you know, the more I uncovered, I mean, she, I, I discovered had through a, a conversation with my dad's godmother, uh, Kamadre Mary, in her 90s, I was fortunately interested in genealogy by the point she was still alive and was able to have a conversation with her. And she let, told me that my grandmother and she had shared a history of having to, to go to an orphanage at St. Clair's in Denver in the 1930s. And I looked at more into that time period and, and a lot of people did send their children to orphanages during that time period, even if they were still alive. But uh, there was just a lot of poverty and, and there wasn't really a safety net. And so if they couldn't afford to take care of all of their children or some of their children, um, they sent them to orphanages for a period of time until they could get back on their feet. Um, also, there was a lot of illness, uh, instability, uncertainty, and families are often separated. So uh, in that sense, a lot of those children did go to orphanages during that time period, and apparently my grandmother was one of them. So, and then she got, you know, had my uh, aunt very young as a teenager, and then my dad and um, had more children through the years. Uh, my my grandfather was not a good man. They separated. Uh, she was a single mother having to work, you know, two or three jobs to make ends meet. They they were in the abandoned railroad car, and the, in Colorado Springs, they also lived like in a chicken coop in someone's backyard. I mean, just lots of these stories that I I did grow up hearing were clearly of extreme poverty um, and, and adversity. So when I started researching her father and grandfather and and their families, I was shocked to learn that uh, they actually were were very prominent, uh, well-educated, uh, successful people. And I was trying to think back to the timeline of when I discovered the Pacheco Ranch. Um, later on in life, I connected with my aunt, Louise. And I think she was really into the ranch. And so I think she's the first one who told me about it. And and my uh, husband at the time and I took a trip out there and managed to find it. I remember, I think we were on our way back from a col- trip to Colorado. And we knew it was north of Clayton. And I think we were at a, we stopped starting in maybe Trinidad. Actually, I do. We, we stopped at the Trinidad Tourist um, Center there and started asking people. And then just sort of along the the highway, we just kind of would stop and just ask people and just try to see if we could hit on the right person. And we did. And that person gave us the name of the current caretaker of the Pacheco Ranch. And uh, he was a uh, very uh, sweet to let us uh, come on the property. And I think, I don't remember how we found our way out there. It's very remote. And, uh, you know, as long as we opened a gate, we shut it. Um, and the house was still there. They have it out, outfitted for hunters or had it at the time. Um, it's currently being lived in by a family right now, but it had been, you know, maintained. Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. I remember coming uh around the bend in the road it's in a little canyon and gorgeous two-story rock house with a you know rock rock uh, fence around it and a lot of outbuildings and uh, just surrounded by cottonwood trees towering cottonwood trees and it was just incredible and you know, we learned a little bit more, you know, stopping, I think, at the Hertzstein Museum and Clayton. Learned a little bit more through talking with people uh, that this ranch was huge, that it was still called the Pacheco Ranch. And and I remember we, we drove away back home just sort of in a little bit of shock. Like, what, what did we just see? This was totally incongruent with what I had heard about the family, the Pacheco family what limited information I had. So when I started to do the research, 
um, it became clear that uh, my grandfather, Juan, our great grandfather, Juan Andreas Pacheco, was a very prominent man. He was educated at St. Mary's College in Mora. He was a county clerk for many years in Union County. He was on the draft board in World War I. He um, served on all kinds of committees and school board and stuff like that. Um, they had a school district named after him. Um, he owned a store, um, a, a general store uh, with Jess Maloof. Uh, I still haven't been able to identify where that was, if it was in Clayton or if it was out in the country. There were ads in the Clayton newspapers for the store. And uh, he was just a very well, res- very well respected man. Um, I remember we went out uh, for a family trip one time. And of course, I was in the courthouse at Union County, one of my favorite places in the world. And uh, my dad and my aunt were with me. And they got bored. Uh, as anybody who, you know, is a, a sad tag along on one of your research trips when you're trying to look up records forever. Uh, they got bored. So they started wandering around the courthouse. And so my dad is very chatty. Um, so he got to chatting with somebody in a different office. And they said, oh, you know, um, there's this old picture here of the when they there was a tornado that came through Clayton that took the top off of the courthouse. And they uh, rededicated the new uh, dome with a ceremony. And the the county uh, officers at the time were posed in front of the courthouse. And he said, you know, I think this was the original. <laughs> there was this the original copy of the photo. And the guy took it down from the wall and looked at the back. And there were names written on the back of it. And there was a picture of my great-grandfather. Awesome photo. He's got like a you know, awesome, like, vest on, and his he's wearing his hat that's, like, uh, real jaunty. Just a totally amazing photo uh, that we had never, of course, seen before. We, we only had one photo of him. It was very poor quality. And we just started learning more and more about his story and the family, and it's just been an absolutely delightful journey learning more about this wonderful man and his legacy. So um, he uh, started, well, okay. Mm. It's just really hard to know uh, how to go uh, chronologically. Do you go backwards? Do you go forwards? So uh, my grandmother was born in 1919 in April. Her father, Juan Andreas, died in the flu epidemic in uh, November of 1918. So she was actually born several months after her father had passed away. So she did not experience any of his success or his um, accomplishments or the lifestyle that they had, to be honest, like the older siblings had. This is a a long, uh, you know, you get into the oral history family stories. And uh, what I had always heard is that uh, they had this ranch. And then when when Juan Andreas died, he was only like 50 years old. And he just had this huge amount of land. Uh, Supposedly, he was really good friends with uh, the banker, Jesus Trujillo, I believe is his name. And and then they had another friend as well. And so they sort of, you know, especially it was very hard to homestead out in that area in Union County. And so as people sort of gave up their land, moved away, he as the county clerk kind of was in a prime position along with the banker and the, with their other friend to know what property was going to become available. He would make an offer and eventually amassed this huge, huge property. Uh, for He started out as sheep raising and then moved to cattle. So he had this huge ranch, a beautiful ranch home. Um, the, the town that's around there that, that was supposed to be the town where the ranch is is Cuates, which means twins. 
Um, I, I haven't identified the twins. I wonder if maybe they had twins that they lost or something maybe, or because I haven't really, I, I did find records from in the newspaper of other people unrelated who were had homesteaded out at Cuates, according to the newspaper. Uh, but primarily, I think it was the Pacheco family and then the Rodriguez family. The Rodriguez family was uh, uh, Florencio Rodriguez was the husband and the wife was um, Juan Andreas's sister. So those two ranches were next to each other. I had the pleasure of meeting a cousin, Andrew Rodriguez, uh, who is the descendant of that Rodriguez line, who took me out in the middle of nowhere and uh, took me down into the canyon where the Rodriguez Ranch was. And it was so amazing. There you could still see some of the fruit trees were still down there that they had planted. Uh, this there was still like a, you know, where they had had put in the in the creek they had put or in the spring I think they had the little basket where they put the food down there to stay cool was still there. It was amazing. So they were out there, uh, Quatas, uh, from about uh, 1900, and. He, uh, they built this beautiful rock house. His name and the family's names are etched into the stone still out there, which is just really wonderful. If I can figure out how to post photos, um, I will do that. Um, so it's just it was just so interesting that, you know, though he had this this amazing life and success for his family, um, it all went away after he passed away. He died very suddenly. His eldest son, Emilio, uh, was in his 20s. I believe he was maybe 22. No, maybe 20 at the time. Um, he had, was he married at that point? I should check my notes. Uh, but he, he ended up marrying uh, a woman from a local, uh, very wealthy family, the Aragons. Uh, from, she was from a... Um, Mexhoma, I believe, uh, just across the, the line into Texas or Oklahoma. Um, so the story was that for many people that Emilio took over the ranch and his wife, who they called the Duchess, had very high class tastes. And so couldn't quite manage the ranch. I mean, not, not, it just takes a special person to be able to run a ranch like that. That's so gigantic and so much property and so many people to manage. And he was so young. I don't think he quite had it at that point. And so he gambled, he had a gambling problem evidently and gambled the ranch away. And it was interesting because then when I went into the land records, I could see that it had, I could see the record, you know, that it was, so when, when Juan Andreas died, I believe half of it went to the eldest son, Emilio, and the other half was split among Inesita, my great grandmother, and the remaining seven children. And so it's unclear to me if he only owned half of it, like how, how is he even able to honor that debt? Did she just have to go along with it? Was there a threat of violence? I just, I don't really see, I mean, Clayton and that whole community seemed pretty tight knit and it was a very well-respected family. I just seems odd that someone would like strong arm the family into like giving up this ranch, but I don't know. So, but I could see in the land records that I don't think that my great grandmother was literate, a, which is also odd to me because her husband was college educated. He was the county clerk. He had a gorgeous penmanship. You can see his signature and his handwriting in all of the records as county clerk. But she didn't write or maybe read. I don't know that. I don't, maybe there's a story there. I don't know. Maybe she didn't want to. I, who knows? Um, 
So it's just her mark, you know, like an X. So that she did sign away the ranch. And so the ranch was gone within a couple of years of Juan Andreas's death. And according to many family members, including my grandmother, they were left with nothing. They had to move to Clayton. Uh, at that point, you know, a lot of the children were older. The, the eldest daughter got married immediately, like immediately, which is really interesting that that maybe maybe she felt that, you know, with her eldest brother and the duchess in, as the head of households that she wanted to just get out of Dodge. I don't know. But she got married immediately, uh, got her own place with her husband, and... Uh, one of the daughters had um, a young daughter uh, who um, there wasn't a, the fa- a known father, I guess. Um, and so she was about the same age as my grandmother. Uh, so she they grew up together. And then there was another son, Tony, who was a town musician in Clayton. He played music at all the dances and stuff like that. So this little family moved into Clayton in a house that's still there. Um, And the daughter, uh, the little girl, uh, stayed in Clayton. Uh, Her name was Emma Sintas. She worked at the Farmers and Stockman's Bank for many years as a secretary. Many people know her in Clayton. Uh, Her husband was Eli Sintas, who's also well known. And we would go visit her in that house, of course, years for years, I had no, you know, I didn't know anything about my family history. I didn't know any book questions to ask. I really wish that I had known at the time who she was and and the story she could have told. Um, so this little family uh, was in Clayton, and I guess my great grandmother and Yasita had to try to make ends meet, doing laundry for people or see, or you know sewing stuff like that. And it was a really hard life. And that is apparently at the point when my grandmother was sent to the orphanage in Denver, uh, St. Clair's. And it's just a really heartbreaking story, you know, and then and then my grandmother just had a really hard life from then on. But then looking back at when you go back a little farther into this family, there's a, more of these, the same pattern. Uh, this ups and downs, these rags to riches or riches to rags. Or... So I, I went back a little bit farther. Juan Andreas's father was Antonio Maria Pacheco. And he is a larger than life character who, as far as I can tell, has sort of been, he's like the Forrest Gump of New Mexico history. He's been like uh, just skirting all these major events in New Mexico history in the 1800s, but there's almost nothing written about him. Um, if I win the lottery, I will dedicate my life to trying to fig- like piece all this together and find more about him or sources about him and write a book about him or something because he's a fascinating dude, this guy. So he was married three times. He had, I believe, 19 children. Um, I will probably need to correct that later. Um, He was, um, his parents were Juan Andreas Pacheco and Maria Barbara Labadie uh, from the famous uh, Labadie family from Santa Fe, um, the famous doctor uh, Dominique Labadie. So they were a very prominent family in Santa Fe. When I have my cousin Robin on, she knows so much more about uh, that part of the family and that part of the story, but uh, we'll, we'll save that for another time. So Antonio Maria Pacheco was, so he was born into a prominent family. He clearly had some status and some power from a young age. Uh, he was the first uh, sheriff of, a re- of Rio Riba County when the U.S. took over uh, New Mexico. So uh, when the U.S. took over, as far as I can tell, they sort of came in 
and we're like, okay, who are all the white people? Who are the Anglos? Uh, we don't care what you're doing. We're going to put you in charge. And, and then after they ran out of uh, Anglos, then they went to prominent Hispano uh, men for leadership positions and appointed them to various leadership positions. So that tells me a lot about <clears throat> well, about Antonio Maria Pacheco and his status as a young man to get that appointment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there are little hints here and there. Um, Rio Reba, a New Mexico County by Robert Torres and Robert Trapp, um, mentions him uh, in, in a discussion of early Rio Reba County and law enforcement. <clears throat> so uh, he is mentioned as, as being in Los Luceros, which was um, where, you know, at early days they didn't have uh, official courthouses and things like that. So they would use uh, homes, private homes that were, you know, large. And uh, Los Luceros was one of those sites. Uh, if you have not been to Los Luceros, please go there immediately. It is incredible. Uh, back when we first started researching and we found out about it, which I think was before, did we know that uh, Antonio Maria Pacheco was stationed there at some at that point? I'm not sure. But uh, famously, my cousin Robin and I, on an early family history trip, uh, it was, I think the state owned Los Luceros, but it wasn't, like they weren't doing anything with it. Um, it wasn't open to the public or it was, or by appointment only or something. So anyways, we hopped the fence as you do. And Robin had a grievous back injury <laughs> after that adventure. Sorry, Robin. Um, I, she's a bit on the shorter side. Um, so I think that we got, we like wheeled out a suitcase and then she like stepped up onto the suitcase and then like kind of just try to roll over the fence and didn't go well. So we, of course, went to Los Luceros. You go down that little road, little path through the tree, the apple trees, and then see that house. Oh, my God. It's just amazing. And since then, uh, in the uh, uh, last couple of years, they have made it a historic site. It's well-staffed. They have interpretive staff now. They have an agricultural director, this heritage farming and ranching um, it's open for tours. You can go through the house. Um, just such an amazing resource. Please go there if you haven't support them, if you can, and definitely have a picnic. It's absolutely outstanding. So anyways, so there is a mention of Antonio Maria Pacheco as sheriff there at Los Luceros at a, in a court setting. Um, he also, uh, we also found his oath that he took when he first took office at the New Mexico State Archives. Um, we also have been able to find the territorial legislati legislative journals that are actually online. They're on Google Books. Thank God for Google Books. Um, so we were able to find, I'm, I'm still having a hard time. I've asked a couple of times, I haven't gotten an answer about, is there a list of all of the legislators for each territorial assembly in New Mexico? Does that exist? I don't know. So I've only been able to sort of piece together from what journals are available that uh, Antonio Maria Pacheco was a delegate at the Democratic Convention in Albuquerque in 1857. Uh, in 1859, he was in the na uh, Ninth Legislative Assembly uh, representing Rio Reba County, also in 1860. He also, I, I forgot to put this in my notes, but um, there's like a, a book also I found on Google Books about politics in New Mexico. And he was a candidate for, it was pretty early days. I want to say it was like 1850. So this guy was a mover and shaker. And uh, he was lived in uh, La Veita, if I'm saying that correctly, which is right by Los Luceros, uh, for many years, but eventually moved to Mora. We don't know why. It might just be like, 
I don't know. I've heard that, you know, you your family had a like a slice of land you wanted to be along the river, right? And then you got to divide it up uh, to give t- your children would get a little slice. So eventually those, as you have more kids, that slice gets just really eaten up. But he was the father of all these children. So um, I can understand like why his kids would leave, but I don't. Anyways, we can only speculate probably maybe, um, you know, Mora was opening up. A lot of families were moving to Mora as that area was opening up. So maybe they were just... Uh, looking for more land which they got lord um so he then represented he was again on the in the territorial um legislature in 1866 representing mora county and the legislative journals he was real chatty um but nothing like super juicy he was he loved to make motions um and he it was like a lot of legitimizing children. Like that was something that the legislature did was legitimize children. It just seems really odd. Uh, I'd love to know more about that. Um, and in the 1870s, uh, oh, sorry, 1875, this might be related. He, in 1875, he was elected treasurer of the Republican convention in Mora. Uh, if you haven't, if you are not totally tuning me out, you will note that I said in 1857 he was a delegate at the Democratic Convention. Um, I did read a book. I'll do it for a book report. Um, it was about New Mexico politics at this time, and they did mention that a lot of fa- uh, prominent Hispano families, uh, po- or just political uh, situation in New Mexico, was not so tied to parties like we are now. Uh, people were less attached to this party or that party. It was more about like alliances with families. Um, so I got, so people, uh, to, to bring back an old term, flip-flopped a lot. Remember when we, <laughs> we were talking about flip-flopping all the time? Um, so I guess that's not a surprise, but possibly related I believe also in 1875 he was arrested for not paying taxes Uh, the irony being of course when he was sheriff I think that was probably like his primary role was collecting taxes Uh, however when I found this information in the uh, New Mexico State Archives there were pages and pages of other people who were being arrested for the same thing so I suspect that there's some kind of uh, political maneuvering going on there, some attempt to take down, I'm guessing, people who were in a certain alliance over other alliances for uh, tax evasion or whatever. Um, So anyways, this guy was like, uh, oh, he also, (laughs) so he was in the New Mexico uh, Legislative Assembly during the time period when, if you don't know about this slice of New Mexico history, I, I read the book about it, I'll do it for a book report, where the chief justice of, of New Mexico was, uh, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, Slew, Sloth, uh, Justice Sloth, Slow, S-L-O-U-G-H, um, who you might know from his military history, uh, in New Mexico as well, but he um, he was a chief justice and he was assassinated uh, in broad daylight in the lobby of the Exchange Hotel, which is now La Fonda Hotel in Santa Fe, by a legislator who was then acquitted. Um, and it was all over like, just like petty crap, like just S talking in the newspapers and gossip and rumors and uh, slander and um, the chief justice had a a temper. He was very short tempered and I guess spouted off about some stuff and uh, anyways I guess it was a sort of like um, par for the course. I mean there was a lot of violence back then. Uh, He was acquitted. He was acquitted. Anyways I there weren't that many 
legislators during this time period. I mean, I read the journals and everything. And so you have, they all, I guess, stayed at the exchange hotel when session was, was going on. So I, I have to infer that Antonio Maria Bacheco was there. But of course, I read the whole stinking book about this whole thing, and he is not mentioned. But he had to have been there. He had to have been part of this whole crazy situation or been in the fray. Um, it's just really wild. He also, this was a time period when um, the federal government was trying to, like sl- slavery was abolished, right, this time. But they were taking issue with uh, the system of peonage in New Mexico. That they were getting word that actually, hey, slavery is still sort of going on in New Mexico. They just sort of call it something different. It looks a little different, but still not great. Um, however, uh, many of the prominent Hispano families in New Mexico at that time, including legislators, were practicing that a form of peonage themselves. And what's interesting about Antonio Maria Pacheco, I am descended from his third wife, Maria Luisa Martinez, and we cannot find anything about her. Uh, probably the, the top genealogists in New Mexico, uh, would, in, I will include my cousin Robin, who's phenomenal, have not been able to locate her where she's from, who her parents were. And the really kind of only logical conclusion is that possibly she was a, a indigenous, that she was from a native uh, family that she'd been adopted or, or something. And that's why there's really no history on her, no, no, can't track her down. So if that's true, uh, this dude was like I think like arguing this in the legislative assembly meanwhile at home he's like married to one of these ladies um it's all it's it's a lot so um what's interesting is that one of the first things that I discovered when I first met Robin on ancestry.com she had all the family stories I had zero so she told me the story about she had heard that Antonio Maria Pacheco was a big shot. We didn't know what a big shot at the time, but he was a big shot and he they lived in Mora and he liked to relive his olden uh, glory days by going back up the Santa Fe Trail, which was not in the 1880s was not a thing anymore, but he liked to relive those days and trade his furs Uh, around Clayton. So he would go back up the Santa Fe Trail to the Clayton area. He had really good dances in Clayton. So he liked to like trade his furs with people and go to these dances. And one of the stories uh, alleges that he was uh, on the shorter side of life. And but yeah, that's why he got a big personality and a big mouth to make up for it. So he ran his mouth off at the wrong people and they beat him up and left him for dead on the Santa Fe Trail outside of Clayton. Uh, The other story versions of the story were that uh, some rough dudes uh, beat him up, left him for dead and stole his furs. Or he like, maybe there was a argument over a girl or something. I don't know. Um, which these all sound like tall tales, but it was so wild then when I located the 1885 um, territorial census and found him. And under like the notes or whatever, the census taker had written that he was paralyzed. And a year later, he died. We found his death record. So this sort of like verified this story about that he was beaten up and left for dead on the Santa Fe Trail outside of Clayton and they had to haul him back home and then he died from his injuries. He was paralyzed in the 1885 census. So there might actually be some truth to that story. 
So then we find his probate records at the state archives in in, uh, Santa Fe. And we were so fortunate. They had them transcribed by Patricia uh, Sanchez Rao. Uh, Such an amazing resource. We're all so lucky to have her. She's been just so generous with her time and helpful um, transcribing stuff for us. So she transcribed all of those records. They're actually available to read on uh, Henrietta um, Martinez, Christmas, Christmas Martinez. Oh, gosh, I should check that. Um, Her blog, which is an amazing resource as well. um, You can actually read that on her blog. Um, So what we found when we looked at those records, it was, first of all, incredibly detailed in terms of inventory of his uh, possessions, which was so beautiful because you could see they had a Nika Kneeler and then they had five Santos, which is just like a beautiful little personal glimpse into their lives. Uh, what I would not give for one of those Santos, oh my gosh. Um, so Antonio Maria Pacheco, mover and shaker that he was, we had already found like a zillion land records for him in the rec- in the. Mora, Mora County records. Um, that was when they were like kept in these trailers, like these temporary trailers. It's really terrifying. I hope that they've moved them to a new building. I know that they built a new city building or a county building in, in Mora, but last I heard they hadn't moved into it yet. Oh boy, I don't want to think about it. Um, so we found like a million land records where he was either buying land or selling land. Um, and then sure enough in the probate, his estate was worth in today's money over $4 million. So he was, so he had a lot going on. Um, his wife, Maria Luisa Martinez, died about a year later. And in her, rec- her uh, court records around her uh, estate, she had nothing there was nothing left there was nothing left for her or for her children um his children from his previous marriages got like a lot of money and the the children from this third wife my great uh, grandmother uh, maria luisa martinez got nothing so that's another kind of uh, thing that makes us wonder if she was a native woman, that she just sort of had less status, no representation. Her children were not, at, didn't have the status that her, her children from her, or his children from previous marriages had. Um, so that left Juan Andreas Pacheco, my great grandfather, who was 16 at the time, with basically nothing. Um, as well as the the other children. Uh, luckily, some of the older ones were married at that time, so they were okay. Um, but uh, one of the younger children, Elias, uh, was I think six maybe or eight, and he was sent to live with. A le- according to the the stories, a f- long lost family volunteered to take him uh, at that time after they were orphaned. And he ended up being abused by that, those people, whoever they were. We don't know who they were. Um, and Juan Andreas later, a few, several years later, heard about this and went and rescued him. And that story comes from Elias himself, uh, who is Robin's grandfather. So we know that to be true. Um, as far as I can tell, Juan Andreas was 16. His best friend was his nephew so because Antonio Maria Pacheco had all of these kids he obviously had much older children my family is the same way we have six children in our family my oldest brother is like 25 years older than I am and my sister is 24 23 years older than I am so they have kids that are older than I am and I'm technically their aunt. So same kind of situation uh, where uh, the uh, his old, Andreas's older half-sister Soledad Pacheco 
had a son named Juan C. Martinez, who was the same age as Juan Andreas. So uh, they were buddies. And Soledad Pacheco and her husband, uh, Rumaldo Martinez, had a gigantic ranch outside of Folsom. And he was one of the earliest settlers out in that area. He grazed sheep out there earlier. He was one of the first uh, landowners out there in Folsom, which was like early, early days of frontier. More about him in future episodes because he's a fascinating guy. So uh, I, I lose track of Juan Andreas for a couple of years, but then he turns up in Folsom. So my speculation, of course, is that as a 16-year-old, newly orphaned, uh, not left with really anything, he uh, probably went to hang out on the ranch and work with his uh, best friend slash nephew, Juan C. Martinez, on his uncle's ranch in Folsom. Uh, That's also when the railroad was coming through there. So there are probably just lots of opportunities for a young man, a couple of young dudes who are like on their own and trying to, to, you know, make their own way. So Juan Andres turns up in Folsom in uh, the 1890, I think. Folsom newspapers are, I remember looking at those newspapers in the Raton Library, public library. Up on the second floor, they had microfilm. These, uh, they had a couple of, you know, it was real spotty, but they had newspapers from Folsom on microfilm that were difficult to read. I probably uh, strained a few brain cells and definitely my eyeballs um, looking at those newspapers. But I did find him. It's a cute little mention of, you know, the newspapers back then were real like, wink, wink. And so it was a cute little mention of Juan Andreas that he had found the one or something like that, which tells me that A, he was well known in the community as a young man, Uh, B, he had people sort of rooting for him, and C, that like his love life or personal life was sort of like a, a fodder for newspaper gossip which is really cute and I I think he he married my great grandmother shortly after that so must uh, I can only assume that that was about my great grandmother and also based on the timing Juan C. Martinez held a dance at his house in Folsom uh, shortly before that so my of course again speculation is that uh, my great grandmother Inesita, who lived in Trinchera, Colorado, across the border, uh, came down to Folsom for the dance, and that's where they met. That's where he, she, and Juan Andres met. So, um, they got married in 1893 in Folsom, or sorry, Trinchera. He was living in Folsom at the time. In that uh, cute little church in Trinchera that's still there, it's not in great shape last time I was there, but hopefully the community can come together and and uh, spruce that one up. It's a, a lovely little church. Um, and then this is the most recent thing I've discovered, which is so bizarre and I still can't even believe it. I, I For years I didn't know where they were until they started the ranch in Cuates north of Clayton that's currently still the Pacheco Ranch or called the Pacheco Ranch um, I, I sort of speculated that they were um, maybe in the area because the two their two oldest children were listed consistently that they were born in Oklahoma Territory in Mineral and I was at one point able to stop into the uh, Cimarron Heritage Center in Boise City, Oklahoma. Great place to stop. Worth the trip. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, and and they had a little a book with a section on Mineral City, Oklahoma, but not a whole lot about it. So I had, I sort of had a vague notion of that, 
I literally, after over 10 years, I, I just feel like such a dummy. I finally, I stopped again at that, at the Cimarron Heritage Center and thought to look at their homestead records or, I mean, they had like really easy, easily accessible books with, they were indexed. And I'd only ever looked in New Mexico, I guess. I never looked in Oklahoma. And there he was, Juan Andreas Pacheco, homesteaded in Oklahoma territory, uh, in land adjacent to Black, what's now Black Mesa State Park. Uh, I looked. At, I also looked, of course, at the BLM record, homestead records, which I'd also looked at a million times and found all the records on that. For New Mexico, I never looked at Oklahoma. Oy. So... I found, you know, where he homesteaded in Oklahoma ter- on the in the Panhandle. Uh, you know, near Kenton. Uh, I've just like been through this area eight million times and never occurred to me to look at it there. I just I feel like such a dumb dumb. It just goes to show you that you know you kind of think that you have these people nailed down, and then you just find this whole other huge thing. And this is why I haven't made it past like 1850. Sorry, guys. So I did just discover that when they first got married, they did start out with a homestead, which is so after, you know, you look at his father was so prominent, had such vast land holdings, uh, this vast wealth when he died, and then his son, who was 16 at the time, was left with nothing and ended up having to homestead, you know, like any any other American citizen who wanted to make a go of this. So he and this land out in the panhandle of Oklahoma, yikes, I have no idea that I found the the records of my, my cousin Lori. Uh, I, I was like trying to figure out how to get the records from the National Archives because, of course, I've been at the National Archives and got homestead records and all kinds of Civil War records, all kinds of stuff in like 2013, 10 years ago, and didn't think to look up records in Oklahoma for him, which I need to just get over it. Let's just move on. Um, so my, but my cousin Lori happened to be at the National Archives and reached out and said, hey, is there anything that you need to look up? This was literally like shortly after I discovered this new information. And I was like, oh my God, please look up these records. So she sent them to me and there's a description of the, the land improvement, of course. And they said they were like raising crops and had livestock out there. I don't know how they were doing it. Maybe the the dry Cimarron River was, or the just the, the natural springs of that area were, that was a good year. I think it was a good time period for that. I think I read somewhere or someone told me that that was actually like a good, they were really rock and rolling at that time. And then, it, you know, of course it dried up later, but that happened to be a nice, a good time period. People could actually try to make a go of it out there, but whoo, that must've been rough. Um, It also was, um, the same location. I went to the Oklahoma History Center years ago, and I remember walking into the the section on uh, Native history, and they had a yucca uh, sandal when it, right when you walked in. And I remember stopping at that display, staring at it for like a good ten minutes, and trying to wrap my mind around that sandal. And I remember that the display said that it was found in Kenton, Oklahoma, and how weird that seemed. Like, how is why how how is somebody making a sandal out there out of yucca? Like, I can't remember how many thousands of years ago. Anyways, I remember distinctly being obsessed with a sandal, and it turns out that that sandal, along with other other artifacts and and uh, bodies uh, had been found in caves in the same area where my family homesteaded in o- by Cl- by Kenton. Just wild. Like how, after all of this time, how am I still finding these incredible things about my family? 
So uh, when you look at these, uh, this sort of uh, ups and downs of this family wealth, um, this was in 1886, 1885, 1886, 87, that Antonio Maria Pacheco uh, was paralyzed. He died and then his wife died and were uh, wiped out mysteriously. And the only uh, explanation that seems to make sense is that uh, that was the era of the Santa Fe ring. And in fact, when you, you know, I didn't know when I first found those land records, that was one of the first things I found were those land records in Mora. But looking back, I remember I was just going, you know, it's good to just go through all your records every once in a while, every couple of years, just to see, you know, things that you didn't know the last time you looked at them. So it was years later, I looked through those land records again and saw names on there like T.B. Catrone, Catron, however you say that, um, Stephen Elkins, uh, that, that are names then that I, I knew are associated with the Santa Fe ring. And so was that, was that money Was it corruption? Did were members of the Santa Fe Ring uh, take that money, take that land, take that wealth away from my great grandmother and her children? We don't know, of course, for sure. Uh, I will uh, throw in a, yet another crazy anecdote. <laughs> uh, so I I ended up uh, hooking up with a woman who lives um, outside of Moore. She lives in Ladue. And she was showing us her house, which was the house of, oh my, uh, Agapita Abeda. Uh, and she was just, oh, I think we were looking at the, the photos that she had. Uh, and she said, oh, this is, this is actually the family that owned this house. And, um, I, of course, being who I am, knew who Agapita Abeda was, which is so random. Who knows that? And I said, oh, wasn't he, wasn't he like the sheriff of Mora County back in like the 1880s? And uh, she said, yeah, the whole family was, you know, he had this store. He actually ran the store out of the house. And uh, I have the record of, of when he, you know, we, we know when he added this on and this part of it on or whatever. It was such a cool house. It's really cool experience. So the next day I checked my records and, and checked the dates and uh, the probate records and Agapita, Agapito Abeda was, uh, was he the sheriff? Was he the judge? What, what, what? He had a, a position in those court proceedings for the probate for Antonio Maria Pacheco. Uh, he was the bailiff, maybe he was the bailiff. And when you look at, they uh, allocated funds to within the records, they did add, allocate openly some of these funds to pay alleged debts or whatever. And like the judge received a payment, the bailiff received a payment, the share, like it was just like, is this not a conflict of interest like you all are proceeding over this court proceeding where you're ruling that like I mean we're looking at thousands of dollars like like a hundred thousand dollars in some cases is being given to the people who are running this proceeding like is this I don't know this seems totally legit um anyways so like looking at the dates of that the um Maybe I shouldn't be talking about this. Is this, this seems like, I know it's 2023 and I'm gossiping about the 1880s, but I don't know, maybe their descendants would be upset that I'm drawing this conclusion, but maybe it's a coincidence. He, he did add on, Abeda added that new addition to his home uh, shortly after receiving this payment from uh, my great great grandfather's 
probate. Um, so maybe I'm not saying that there's anything sketchy about that. Like he just, he received some money from my great grand grandfather estate and then he built an addition onto his house so that's draw your own conclusions I don't know uh, but it was just absolutely hilarious that I was able to tell this woman that my great great grandfather paid for this room of her house that she's has her that's her bedroom <laughs> it's a wild world out there when you look at the whole arc of this history, you have this very successful family, very successful man, Antonio Maria Pacheco, loses everything. His son has to start over from scratch. He builds up this huge amount of land holdings, success, status, then he loses all of it. It's gone. And then again, his children are left to pick up the pieces. And my grandmother was not able to do that, uh, unfortunately. Although, I mean, she, she um, later in life, I think she, she did remarry. They lived in the LA area. He was a, he was a caddy at the LA Country Club, and I think did really well or did you know okay. Um, they had a cute little house. Um, that of course sold for like gazillions of dollars after they moved out and uh, had passed away and died and uh, moved out. Um, so she did okay, but anyways, my my father beat a, like so many odds and uh, got went to co- well college. He was the first one in his family to go to college. After his uh, guidance counselor told him what was the use in applying to college because he was just a dumb Mexican, uh, he went to college, he graduated, he has two master's degree, and then he went and got a PhD. And, you know, we didn't like, and I'm his sixth child, so, um, you know, I, I probably had the most benefit of all his accomplishments. And, you know, we, we, we didn't have a lot of money by any means, but... Uh, you know, I never had to worry about where my next meal was coming from. I got to go to a good college. Um, I had a lot of advantages that, um, you know, that he didn't have for sure growing up. So my dad's a part of that story too. He picked up those pieces and made a success that's a really an echo of his grandfather and his great grandfather. So I just I I love this family so much. I wish of course that I, I knew it, that I had known my grandmother better. Um she went by Mary. We knew her as, you know, gr- Mary uh, growing up and then, you know, once even once I started doing research um I I anticipated that her name was Maria something like they all are. Uh but no uh, she used to no Maria in her name. Her name was uh, Ignacia Josefa. I found and uh, found her baptismal record. There was no Maria, so she just made up Mary, which I think was probably pretty common during her era to sound more American or or more white. So, I I'd be curious too, <clears throat> you know, how much she knew about her family history and um. Or even about her father, I, I, from what I, you know, I ask everybody, of course, and it seems like she didn't really talk about her father very much or her mother, actually, to be honest. So, uh, again, I, I love highlighting the story and and bringing this out and and just having a lot of pride, too, in our family story, you know, the hard times and uh, the better times, the successes. So. Uh, I'm I'm proud to be a Pacheco. I think that uh, you know, especially going back to the ranch, uh, we actually have a, a trip planned to go back to visit the ranch and discover. A, a, my uncle has never been there, and we really want to visit Juan Andreas's grave, which was it's just a really special story I I can share at another time. But uh, that's it for now. I went really long, but there's so much to this story. And I hope 
you know, once I get past like 1850, 1850 uh, that I will have more to share about this, but I'll bring Robin on here and she has a lot more to share about this family. So for now, we will leave it. Uh, we'll leave it with Antonio Maria Pacheco. I think he would love that. Thanks for listening to Luminaria. You can reach me at luminariapod at gmail.com. Our intro and outro music is of our Soviana performed by Nieves Anaya and his daughter Ernestina Anaya at Arroyo Hondo, New Mexico in 1940. It's part of the Juan Bautista Rael collection of the Library of Congress. <laughs>